Welcome to the Free Thought Frontier, and I'm your host, Bill Stone. Today, I thought I'd give you a clip from my 2023 Geekin' New Year's Eve special live stream. It may become a feature on my regular monthly live streams, if for no other reason than my children and my family have grown completely bored of tales from my childhood. And so, the following is transcribed. Um, anyways, my, some of my viewers here are probably age appropriate for this. So I'm going to go ahead and kick things off with some uh, tales from Generation X. Um, if you've got any stories about, you know, your childhood growing up in Gen X, please let me know. I'll be happy to throw it out there for the stream. I got inspired to do this um, largely because of a uh, comedian, a Gen X comedian um, named, uh, of all things, Karen, Karen Morgan. Um, she does some really funny stuff. I'm actually going to rip her off a little bit, and I'll, I'll tell you when I'm doing it. Um, but I realized watching her uh, that it turns out that I have a fair amount of shared experience with Gen Xers that I really didn't think about twice. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to throw out a couple of things that happened to me as Gen X. So officially, Generation X is uh, defined as anybody born from 1965 to 1985, making about 62.5 million of us um, here in the United States. We are generally the children of baby boomers or the silent generation, uh, though for some weird reason that I can't figure out, millennials and Gen Z tend to refer to us as boomers. Apparently to them, older people are just like black people to, to racists. We all look alike. Gen Xers, we were the last feral generation. We grew up in an era without the internet and without cell phones. If we wanted to answer a phone call, there was a device that was attached to the wall or sat on a desk. And uh, we couldn't send it to voicemail. In fact, we rushed very hard to get to the telephone. Um, and we had to remember telephone numbers, not using our phones, but rather maintaining them in our heads. I still remember my phone number from my last landline phone that was taken out of uh, where I'm living now, uh, probably only less than 10 years ago now. Our entertainment often came from television, but TV wasn't really oriented to us. We watched some cartoons before and after school and Saturday mornings. Those were completely um, given over to Gen X. We were given all kinds of children's programming. Uh, it could range from classic Looney Tunes cartoons to some rather stupid shows that even we knew at the time were kind of stupid. Um, and a few live action programs. There were a couple of standouts. Star Trek, uh, the, mat the animated series was one of the big ones. Uh, Land of the Lost was a big one that was a standout. Um, Captain Marvel was a big one, the original Captain Marvel, not the one that's, that, that they use on the MCU now, but the actual real Captain Marvel. Um, although even then, you know, having to have Captain Marvel fly in at the very end to tell us what the moral of the story was, was a little bit condescending. But um, as I say, I was kind of inspired to do this by Karen Morgan, um, who is a really great, great Gen X uh, comedian. Um, I... A little bit of what I'm going to steal from her comes from a video that she has on YouTube called Every Generation Explained, and it is linked to in my description box. Please feel free to go and watch that. Uh, I'm only stealing little bits of her uh, act, so um, I won't spoil any of her real act for you. But one of the things that Karen observed about Gen X is that we kind of had the opposite of helicopter parents. We had what she calls Home Depot parents, which is where it looks like there should be somebody who can help you, but there's not. No, nobody's coming. It's like at home, at, at home Depot. If you want a skill saw, there's only one left, and it's way up there above everything else in the uh, store. So just grab a ladder, start climbing, and by the way, be careful not to drop it and cut your arm off on the way down because they're not going to take you to the hospital. And in fact, it's going to be your fault that you got hurt. 
Here's what we as Gen Xers got when we got hurt. Blow on it, rub some dirt on it, walk it off, suck it up, quit your crying or I'll give you something to cry about. That's also evidenced in my own case a few times, and those are the Gen X stories I'm going to tell this time, because I got a million of them, as it turns out. I just didn't realize it until I watched Karen Morgan. Uh, once, when I was about five, I somehow managed to burn the first layer of skin off of one of my fingers. I went home crying. My dad held my finger under room temperature tap water and waited for the layer of skin to kind of slough off. Poured some alcohol on it, which, of course, is a whole lot of fun. Um, then wrapped it up in gauze and told me not to do whatever stupid thing I'd done to get burned in the first place. That was usually a Gen X thing. Our parents would just look at us and go, man, you did something stupid. I guess you know not to do it again, don't you? That's kind of how we learned. We did something stupid. Uh, another time, while riding my bike on a gravel road, I completely wiped out, came down on my right hand, and tore off all the skin on this hand, um, on the palm. I went home. My dad carefully picked out, you know, all of the uh, bits of gravel that were in there, washed it out in room temperature, uh, tap water, poured alcohol on it, which when you're looking at exposed muscle is just oh so much fun in terms of pain and told me to be careful the next time. I also once cut this index finger on the top damn near down to the bone. It was almost to the bone. Today that would uh, necessitate a trip to the ER, probably stitches, but instead my dad put it under room temperature, tap water, poured alcohol into the wound, wound it tightly together with bandages, and told me to be more careful the next time that I was using knives. Um, again, I still, have, I still have a scar. If you know exactly where to look, you can see the slightly deformed spot on my uh, fingernail where the, uh, it, it didn't quite heal back exactly properly. And the scar is just a little bit visible even after 50-some years. The only other time, only real time I ever went to a doctor for anything was when I jumped my bike on homemade ramps. Because back then there was a, a daredevil named Evil Knievel who was uh, really popular and inspired uh, a lot of kids to do the sort of same things he did, only on a smaller scale. A lot of us tended to build, uh, you know, homemade Evil Knievel ramps with plywood with nails sticking up from it. Uh, in my case, I stole steel um, uh, shelving from my father's uh, garage and uh, put those up on cinder blocks. Um, but I came down one of those times and I uh, came down right on my right knee, or should I say just below my right knee, and I in inadvertently um, shattered the bones underneath it. Um, it was behind the kneecap. It wasn't the kneecap itself. It was these little bones behind it. Um, Jeanette says, Evil Knievel challenged many a boy. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And boy, were we all stupid about the various stuff that we made. Um, you know, the fact that there is a wonderful, wonderful footage. Evil Knievel would jump just about you know, a bajillion cars. And there's one uh, where he um, he jumped the uh, uh, it's it's called the um, the what was it? The Caesar's Palace jump where he was jumping a whole bunch of trucks and they were filming it. And he came down um, badly and the on the far ramp he jumped the trucks but he came down badly the whole thing was shot close up in slow motion so you watch this man get completely crumpled up in and around his motorcycle breaking at that point literally every bone in his body he was in the hospital forever they said he'd never walk again but he did got up and step kept trying to jump things Super Crew 63 says uh, he watched Evil Knievel and tried to copy him on his bicycle, ended up uh, planted the, uh, the boys on, on the gooseneck. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, as I say, in this, uh, this particular case, I came down and shattered the bones that were underneath and behind my kneecap. Um, and it hurt. But Gen Xers, we were all kind of used to a little pain. We did stupid things and, and hurt ourselves all the time. And again, you know, blow on it, rub some dirt on it. Walk it off, suck it up, quit your crying. You know, that's what we had. Um, so instead of paying too much attention to the pain, I just went and I built some more ramps that were really no more safe than the one that I had made before and continued to wipe out every time on my driveway. 
When I was uh, finally realized that the pain was more or less permanent, my mother begrudgingly took me to the pediatrician where I was fitted with a full-length cast on my right leg while it healed, and I spent the better part of a semester in the cast. When the cast finally came off, my leg muscles had badly atrophied, and today, of course, this would mean physical therapy. Um, Super Crew 63 says uh, you were too scared to tell your parents because you didn't want to get yelled at. Yeah, that's what they said. That's, I'm sorry. I got to shut the volume off here. There's presently a five alarm fire going on at uh, in um, New York City, and it just keeps going off and off and off and off and off. So, yeah, that was the thing. As I said, um, if you did something stupid and got hurt, it was your fault that you got hurt, and your parents would let you know that it was your damn fault that you got hurt. <laughs> So anyhow, the cast comes off. My leg at muscles are totally atrophied from spending an entire semester straight, you know, not doing anything. Today, you'd go to physical therapy. Back in that time, physical therapy meant my dad um, performing stretches every day, a couple of three times a day to get motion, full range of motion back. It was incredibly painful. And he had absolutely no, that was the other thing, as you say, didn't have the slightest bit of, uh, of, of sympathy for me. I was the dumbass who had tried to jump a, a ramp and went straight into the ground with it. You know, my fault. Um, Jeanette says, between your brother and you, between my brother and I in self-defense, my mom made a rule number one. Uh, one person in the hospital per day. Yeah. Um, we still uh, call dibs on this one rule to this day. Yeah. That's Gen X for you, man. We we didn't, you know, we, we didn't get the, any 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 sympathy when we did something stupid. Well, it was our fault. It was we did something dumb. It was us, you know. So, so my dad did all this stretching, and I remember it being really painful and asking him to stop. But again, no no sympathy. I'd gotten stupid after all. Um, he just stretched my my muscles out and you know told me to make sure that i rode my bike as often as possible until both of my legs were performing equally and it worked um, as a feral generation we were generally ejected from the house every day after school and on weekends with the uh, instruction to go outside and play with the door then being slammed shut behind us and we were not let back in except maybe for meals uh, at which point our mothers would complain that we were tracking dirt, mud, or snow into the house. So people sometimes wonder, younger generations sometimes scratch their head and wonder, why did you guys drink from the hose? Well, the reason we drank from the garden hose is because we were told to go outside and to play and were not let back in. Um, here in Nebraska, it didn't matter whether it was 105 degrees out in the middle of August. It didn't matter whether there was two feet of snow out in the middle of January. We were told to go outside and to play. We would um, just congregate with other children in the general area neighborhood kids who are our age. And, um, you know, basically what we did is we would go around and terrorize the neighborhood. I remember very specifically, we'd run, we would run through people's yards. Uh, we'd climb their fences in order to avoid having to ride our bikes or walk around the block to get where we wanted to go. We just jumped the fence. Uh, I know that our back fence was perennially bent over. Um, despite the fact that my father constantly told us to stop doing it. We would terrorize elderly people, following them around on our bikes while they walked, making fun of their age. Um, we'd hold bike races that crossed intersections that had no stop signs with absolutely no thought whatsoever of any cars that might unexpectedly come across one of the intersections or come out of a driveway and kill us. You know, if, if you couldn't make it through without, you know, getting killed on your bike, you didn't deserve to make it out of Gen X. And we didn't wear helmets. Nobody wore helmets. Uh, that didn't start until my children or, yeah, my children started putting helmets on us. None of us wore helmets. And somehow we got out of uh, our childhoods without too many traumatic brain injuries. Yes, Jeanette says, and no seatbelts either. Yeah, um... <laughs> No seatbelts. Um, God, I don't want to steal too much from uh, from 
uh, Karen Morgan because she she does such a good set on this. Um, but you know, it, it, frankly, we didn't wear seatbelts in the front seat. If if your mother's arm wasn't enough to stop you, you you deserve to go through that windshield. That's that's all there was to it. Yep, you rode in the back of the truck. Um, did that? Uh, no car seats. Absolutely, there were no car seats. I remember when I was very little, my father, who would be driving, would sit me on his lap while he drove. You know, so I could have fun watching that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and those were the best rides. And and you know, if you had a, a station wagon, you would sit in the rear part of the station wagon, facing back, making faces at the people who were behind you. Um, you know, and the races that we had, they would often include slaloming uh, in and out of people's driveways. We didn't have any play dates. We uh, simply found each other and did whatever was we wanted, occasionally getting hurt in the process. But again, blow on it, rub some dirt on it, suck it up, walk it off, quit your crying. Yep, we, uh, Jeanette says you had a rear-facing seat in our station wagon. Yeah, yeah. Um, Again, try not to steal too much from Karen Morgan, but you just sit back there and, you know, be waving, be waving at the people behind you. Just be waving. That's that's what we used to do. Yes. <laughs> um, I certainly recall my next door neighbor. He would be constantly yelling at us to stop um, messing around in his driveway and get the hell off of his newly seeded lawn that he just planted solely in response to our shenanigans going through it um, all the time. I discovered listening to Karen Morgan that we didn't even particularly like each other. I just thought that was me. Um, but no, it was a whole Gen X thing. We didn't really particularly like each other. Um, oh, God, yes, Super Crew 63, you had a set of lawn darts. You, you, oh, God, yes, if we didn't make it through our childhoods um, by getting, you know, falling out of a tree or, or, uh, or getting hurt in a bike or getting, you know, stabbed in the foot with a fucking jart. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, that was our childhood. Man. <laughs> that was our childhoods. We were feral. We didn't care. Um, and if you got stuck in the foot with a dart, you know, you better just pull it out. And then blow on it, rub some dirt on it, walk it off, suck it up, and quit your crying. <laughs> but again, we didn't particularly like each other. I didn't realize that till watching Karen Morgan. Um, we just tolerate each other because the alternative was utter boredom. Um, we would often ride our bikes miles to the nearest uh, shopping center uh, where we would terrorize local businesses. We would also buy candy cigarettes, candy jewelry, and trading cards with bubblegum for whatever happened to be popular at the time. It was never anything like, you know, um, something simple like uh, baseball cards or anything like that. It would be just whatever happened to be popular at the time. That's what we would have our get cards for. And, of course, we'd always get the same 10 cards and end up trading with anybody who had anything like a different card. The other thing that the cards were uh, really good for was sticking in the spokes of your bicycle so you could ride around sounding like a, uh, a motorcycle, boom, boom, you know, with the motorcycle thing going. We love doing that. Um, we sometimes also ran into neighborhood bullies. And because I was the geeky kid, I was always a target. Um, we learned the value of strength in numbers de-escalation, how to de-escalate a, a situation with a bully, and occasionally you'd have to resort to fist fights. Yes, Jeanette says, lawn darts were fun. Absolutely, they were fun. Um, I don't know anybody personally who got stabbed with a lawn dart, but, uh, but I, I, I know that some kids did. Again, blow on it, rub some dirt on it, suck it up, walk it off, quit your crying, you know? <laughs> That were our parents. That was our parents. The opposite of helicopter parents, they were Home Depot parents. Fighting bullies was always the advice of our parents because they would explain that bullies are actually cowards. And if you stood up to them, they'd usually back down and run away. And it turns out they were right um, to my complete bafflement on one occasion. At school, we were playing flag football. And if you don't know what flag football is or was, 
um, you'd wear a little belt around you, and they, each side would have a little flag that was kind of stuck in there, um, attached on the side. And so instead of tackling each other in fourth grade and potentially actually hurting each other, the only time that parents of Gen X kids really cared, um, you would pull the flag off, and that would count as tackling someone. And I know, I assume it was pretty much the same for everybody else. You know, we weren't really playing very, you know, directly. It was pretty half-heartedly. They put me on the line so that I was supposed to stop another lineman from getting through. We were just going through the motions, you know, and not really working very hard at it. But then at one point, I realized that since we weren't really working hard at it, I could just run over to the class bully who was playing quarterback and pull off one of his flags before he had a chance to do anything because nobody was really trying to stop me. I just zip right over there and do it. But I'd do this over and over and I'd frustrate him to the point where he'd uh, intercept me after school and demand satisfaction in the form of a fist fight. I'd usually be able to de-escalate, but on a few occasions, yes, I had to resort to fists. It um, almost it baffled me for quite some time because eventually he confided in me that he considered me his best friend. And I hated his guts and could not understand why he liked me. Much later, um, on, my father told me, who was a psychologist, was long after I had my own children, that one of the ways that boys communicate is through physical altercations like that. Um, unlike women who will hold on to a grudge forever, if you get into an argument with a woman and you think you've won, you haven't. They will take that sucker and put it in the back of their minds and pull it out for the next argument that you have just out of nowhere. But when boys do it, you end up having a, a fight and the matter is settled. There is a clear winner, there's a clear loser, and that's that. And then you tend to get along. And by standing up to this class bully, um, even though he usually won, uh, that made him think of me as his friend. Um, I, I didn't believe it, but that's what it was. Um, Tree Climber 3, hey, nice to see you here. Haven't seen you on my, any of my streams before. So true, fights between boys made best friends. Yeah, my problem was I was such a geek um, that I was often uh, the uh, target of some bully. And uh, I never, it never really, most of them never really liked me very much. But that one kid um, who was the biggest class bully I ever dealt with, as you say, he, he considered me his best friend. I didn't know why because I, I kind of hated his guts. <laughs> uh, tree, climber six, uh, tree, climber, tree Three Climber says you made lots of friends that way. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm looking at my... I guess it's okay. I got a green screen behind me. I'm always I'm always quick to tell people about the theatrical aspects of what I, uh, I do here. Um, you know what you're seeing behind me is not a real cabin. Although by this time next year I will be in one. January. Um, my longtime viewers know that uh, there is some family ranch land still in my family, and I'm going to be uh, buying that out um, next month. And I'll also be pulling in a single wide uh, trailer. And that's where I will be going to live to retire. So by this time next year, I probably won't be using the green screen anymore. Um, I won't have anything quite this picturesque behind me. Uh, but I might very well have two feet of snow. It, it depends. <laughs> but an interesting thing about, uh, let's see, Jeanette says, uh, you finally get to move there? Awesome. Yes, um, my uh, schedule will start to get weird um, come spring or so next year. Uh, maybe even starting in January, because um, I'm going to be buying out the remainder of that land. I am buying out, buying a, a single wide trailer to put out there. I've got an, a backup generator to put in there. I have a whole bunch of stuff that I've got to buy. Um, it blew my mind. But right, if if you couldn't find this place with a GPS, right? I, I mean. You can pinpoint it on a GPS, but you can't figure out how to get there without one. The nearest gravel road is two miles away. The nearest paved road is another 45. And the nearest town on, a, on an actual concrete road is about another 10 miles from there. So this is way out in the middle of nowhere. So you have to be prepared to be, you know, have enough food um, to uh, stock up for potentially six months. 
Um, it doesn't happen frequently, but it does happen when you will have the a total inability to get out um, for long periods of time. So I've got a big ass um, freezer that I'm buying and, you know, be getting ready to stock up on groceries while I'm out there. But the most bizarre thing is um, they have fiber optic Internet run out there. I couldn't believe my eyes. Um, it, it runs across a, a right of way that they have, but they ran fiber optic out there, which blows my mind. I was involved in IT for 40 years and I worked for ISPs and I know what it costs to run fiber optic. They're running fiber optic out to a place where they would maybe get five customers. The amount that they cost to throw it out there blows my mind, but I'm going to have fiber optic out there. I was afraid I was going to have to rely on um, uh, Verizon Wireless. They build out along interstate highways, and so we get pretty good reception on them out there. But I'm going to get fiber into my cabin. Who thunk? You know, I, I was blown away. Couldn't believe it. But, yes, I uh, will be living there full time probably by um, uh, the end of autumn, maybe earlier than that, depending on how things get put in. I, I'm buying so much stuff. I have to buy a tractor, not a big, you know, farm rated tractor, but a kind of midsize one um, with a lawn deck and also a uh, shovel attachment so that if we get two feet of snow, I have some possibility of being able to plow my way out to some extent. Um, as I say, a backup generator, because you can have instances where you get two feet of snow, the electricity goes out, it can be out for days, um, because it's not like they exactly, um, you know, they don't exactly prioritize anything out there. Um, so I've got, I'm going to have a backup generator um, that will be capable of running propane backup generator. But I've got it all priced out. I have budgeted everything in sight out um, so that, uh, you know, my, my mother who passed away in February, uh, she and my father left uh, their descendants uh, a fairly um, sizable, uh, generous um, inheritance. So I'm able to buy all of this. The thing that blows me away is that by this time next year, I'll own all this stuff outright. I will not be doing any kind of loans. I'll just own it all outright. Um, Super Cruise 63 says Starlink gets better all the time because you uh, it watch SpaceX and Falcon 9 launches uh, two times a month. Yes, yes, Starlink is getting better and better. Um, I, I might have gone with Starlink had I not discovered that they'd run um, fiber optic out there. Um, but as long as the fiber's there, I'll take it, you know. One of getting back to Gen X things, one of the things that my um, my father told me much later in life, a bit of wisdom that he gave to me, was um, that uh, in any group of boys, you can tell the IQ of the group of boys by taking the IQ of the dumbest boy and dividing it by the number of boys in the group. And of course, I had children by then, and I, I, <laughs> I saw the wisdom in what he was saying there. Um, my dad died about 10 years ago. I still miss him. I hope that some of his, uh, you know, his wisdom rubbed off on me. I, I can never tell. Uh, Tree Three Climber says, uh, build a uh, Lanto doghouse for that generator. Keeps it dry and quiet. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll definitely think about that. Um, I, I don't expect to have it kick in very frequently, but, um, you know, it does need to be protected from the elements and all that. Um, it's a standalone unit, the one that I, I priced out, um, and it should be capable of, uh, dang it, stop buzzing at me. I shut off, I shut off the, the thing, but now it's going to buzz at me until I get rid of all my alerts. Yes, thank you. Great, now I've accidentally created that too big okay but uh, yeah thank you I'll, I'll, uh, I'll definitely keep that in mind um, any suggestions anyone has I I spent a lot of time on this land when I was uh, growing up but uh, that doesn't mean that I actually fully know everything about living out there um, I've tried to anticipate it but that doesn't mean that I won't figure out you know halfway through the year oh crap I've got to go buy this um, I, I've tried to anticipate everything in sight that I can, um, but uh, I, I don't necessarily think I'll have it all figured out. Um, I did look briefly 
at the very uh, at a very um, uh, the possibility of going solar, but there is no way um, that solar will actually power um, even a single wide trailer for any particular length of time. And it's so expensive. I mean, you could conceivably do it, but buying um, a propane backup generator is just so much cheaper than going solar. Jeanette says, we built a small shed for your generator, but had to modify it several times to get better airflow. Yeah, that's also something obviously I have to look at. What's the airflow look like? Yeah, yeah. The uh, single wide I'm getting was surprisingly um, uh, um, uh, in inexpensive. Um, and the people who take it, they priced it out for me and said, this is what it's going to cost to get it out there. And we're going to set it all up for you, get the central air working, the electric run in, the water run in, put a skirt on it. It'll look really nice. And it's all included in the price. And I had to drive out there with them because it's out there in the middle of nowhere and uh, see, the, you know, and just kind of show them the way out and say, hey, is this going to be a problem getting this trailer in and out? And they just went, no, nah. you know, you're talking to people who do this sort of thing all the time. There's no problem here. We can get this in and out. No problem at all. We, we do this all the time. Um, let's see. Uh, tree, uh, tree Three Climber says a hand pump two inch well would be nice. Well, as it turns out, um, what I'm actually going to own is the controlling shares in the Davis Homestead Reserve LLC. This is an LLC that was set up by my grandmother. Um, it in, the property includes my great grandfather's cabin, log cabin, that he built when, in 1905. And in fact, I looked at the possibility of having that cabin renovated uh, rather than bringing out the trailer but renovating that cabin is way too expensive. It has no running water into it. Uh, it has the electricity running into it is actually a fire hazard right now. You'd need to totally rewire the electricity. Um, but I did look at that. And uh, one of the things that they have out in the front yard is a hand pump well, because that's how they got their water um, was from well water. The water I've got now was run in by uh, from what we call town water. It was run in by the um, you know regular uh, you, w water utility um, and <laughs> running it in cost about twenty thousand dollars because this is out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but I wanted the electricity. I wanted the re regular water. Problem with well water out there is it's really full of iron. It's so full of iron that if you drink it untreated, um, you'll get diarrhea. Um, I once was out there and I caught a fish, a catfish, in the uh, Cheyenne River. I brought it into and put it into a brand new, um, you know, garbage can, you know, a big garbage can, filled it up with well water, dropped the fish into it. An hour later, the fish was dead because the um, iron had clogged up its gills. It was just floating at the top. I thought it was going to be fine. No. So uh, you have to treat the water if you're going to get it out of the well. Um, but there is one out there if I absolutely needed. If something happened to the town water, I could I could still have water. And it's not far from the Cheyenne River, um, which is, you know, fresh water. Uh, you still have to treat it, but it's it's fresh water. Super Crew 63 says another thing, big thing we did back then was uh, hitchhike. Yes, you think it's illegal in most states. And Jeanette said, yes, hitchhiked pretty good, too. Well, I'll tell you a story. Um, this wasn't. Uh, this was when I was a little older. I was 19. I'll never forget this one. Uh, my, uh, I, I was working at a boys camp out in near uh, Brainerd, Minnesota, um, which is out in the land, as it turns out, of the land of a thousand mosquito breeding grounds. And. Um, I was working in the the uh, in the kitchen, right? And this was a really really high end boys camp. We had people whose kids were last names were Hershey, for example. Yes, that Hershey. Um, those were the people that would be out there, really uh, spoiled rich kids. The first thing I got did when I got there was me. They had us mowing the forest. Yeah, we mowed the forest so that these rich kids wouldn't have to deal with, you know, actual outdoor stuff. Um, although there was one crazy guy who was a, uh, uh, a, a Vietnam vet, just the, 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 the absolute stereotypical Vietnam vet, crazy Vietnam vet. 
and he decided one time that he was he was in charge of I don't remember sports or something like that. He decided he was going to take some of the older kids and go on a bivouac. So he actually took them off of the regular property out into where everything was growing naturally and made them wander around in there for about two hours, brought them back, and man, were they in bad shape. These were kids who were not even remotely used to anything like real outdoors. But what they would do with us is, you know, we worked basically three weeks straight, and then we had you know, one weekend off or two days off during the week or something like that. So I would hitchhike in and out of Brainerd um, because there was no way I was going to stay there on my day off. Um, So I would hitchhike. Uh, Hitchhiking wasn't totally gone by then, but it's on its way out. So what I did, because I could at that time do it, I would stand by the side of the road with a sign that said, mostly harmless. And if you know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know where that comes from. I had a sign that I would stick in the ground that says, mostly harmless. And I would sit there and juggle until somebody would stop and pick me up. Um, That worked every single time. In fact, there was one woman I remember. I was at a crossroad. Um, Somebody's going to turn onto the highway. And this woman stopped there and watched me juggling for a while before she la- I said, um, yeah, cop in the car. I'm headed to Brainerd. Uh, I, I, and she said, yeah, I just wanted to watch you juggle. So, yeah, hitchhiking was something that we could do. You could do it in the cities. Um, it was pretty, you know, safe for the most part, pretty safe. Um, as I got older, it was probably less and less safe. I, I wouldn't suggest it now. Um, I do pitch, pick up hitchhikers uh, from time to time. And I may have told this story before. Some of my uh, other viewer, my older view, my regular viewers probably heard the story. But um, I was hitchhiking back from Brainerd to the boys camp one night and there was a tornado warning issued. Tornado warning means that at that time meant that somewhere nearby a tornado had actually been sighted touching the ground you know, actual, real, serious, real-life danger. And I'm out there by the side of the road hitchhiking and juggling, which is just the worst place to be. Um, if, a, if, a hit, if, you know, if a uh, tornado comes by when you're by the side of the road, the only thing you can do is dive into the ditch, um, put your head between your legs, and uh, kiss your butt goodbye because that was probably going to be it for you. So I'm out there hitchhiking and hoping and hoping that nothing actually shows up. Guy stops, picks me up, took me all the way to the gates of the camp, which was actually out of the way. I usually would, you know, go to say, OK, take me to this turnoff. I'll walk, you know, hike the rest of the way in a couple of miles. No big deal. But he took me all the way to the, to the thing and he told me this. He said that he had done it because it was his obligation that for help he had once received, he must in turn to help help 10 others, each of whom would then help. 10 others, so that good deeds would spread out like ripples from a pebble in a pond. He told me I he told me that I was one of his 10 and now he passed the obligation on to me. And I know it sounds like something straight out of a Kung Kung Fu episode. And in fact, that exact almost conversation occurs in an episode of Kung Fu. But this happened to me in real life. So from time to time, I do pick up hitchhikers if they don't look like they're, you know, insane or something. Uh, I last did it with a pair of hippies. Um, That was probably 10 years ago. Uh, I just didn't have occasion to pick them up. I I don't drive a lot anymore. But I didn't even know hippies still existed, but these guys were clearly like hippies. Like, yo, man, uh, mind if I borrow this thing, man? I'm kind of like wanting to, you know, like turn it into a, a pipe so that I can smoke some weed, man, you know? Um, but I, I picked them up and I, I took them almost where they needed to go. I, they were another hour completely out of my way, and I didn't think I could do that because it was Thanksgiving or Christmas or something. I was on my way somewhere. Um, but I did pick up them. And they gave me a lot of hope, actually, because they were not into all the renewable energy fads that will not in any way cover the amount of energy that we need. They were into nuclear. Well, yay! You know, somebody who understands electric isn't going to do it. Solar isn't going to do it. Wind isn't going to do it. Nuclear is the way to go. So I was thrilled. Hippies that get nuclear, you know. I mean, hippies in 1969 would have been, no, man, like, no, we're not going to do any nuclear, man. They could blow up. But no, these hippies, they got it. They understood nuclear was the way to go. 
Anyway, as I say, my uh, my father did mention to me about how to tell the uh, IQ of a group of boys, which was take the IQ of the dumbest group, a boy in the group, and then divide by the number of boys in that group, and you had the group's um, collective IQ, and that was that was probably accurate, <laughs> given given the way that my uh, my friends and I behaved, the stupid stupid things that we did in our childhood. Um, I will tell some more tales from Generation X as time goes on. I'll drop them uh, during the um, live streams that I do. I have a million stories, as I'm sure my viewers do, and you've let me know some of them. I have one that I call the hydrochloric acid. Um, God dang it. This damn thing is buzzing at me. It's probably going to buzz at me every single time. we got about 15 minutes out from a, uh, a midnight. But uh, it really was a saga. Um, it involves uh, how my friend and I, because we were the bright ones, right? We were bright geeks. So we once stole a gallon of hydrochloric acid from one of the science rooms in our school. And it just started from there. So I will leave off the hydrochloric acid uh, um, saga for some other time. <laughs> Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.